Welcome to a City Voices interview with Teresa Theofano, who is a queer affirmative therapist, also a peer with mental health challenges, as well as a person who identifies as a queer person. So, um, and there, uh, we're, we're going to talk about queer affirmative therapy uh, from a whole bunch of different angles. And uh, well, what, let me uh, turn it over to Teresa just to give herself a proper introduction. <laughs> I don't know. I think that was a pretty good one, Dan. Thank you for the thank you for the start. Um, good afternoon or whenever you're watching this. Um, so uh, my name is Teresa. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm employed full time at a small geriatric mental health nonprofit. Um, I also freelance as a writer and editor. And with my friend Stephanie Schroeder, I put together the 2019 anthology Headcase, LGBTQ Writers and Artists on Mental Health and Wellness. Um, I identify as a peer, although I am not a certified peer specialist. And um, I'm really excited to be taking part in this interview today. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you want to explore with me, Dan. Okay, let's begin by exploring um, queerness. Why is it hard to be queer in, in America? That is a broad question that I'm going to try to narrow down a little bit. Um, I think on a, on a very general level, um, LGBTQ plus rights are still tenuous. And as we saw with the previous pre presidential administration, there are um, a lot of advances our communities have made and fought so hard for that can far too easily be rolled back. Um, I think we still live very much in a homophobic and transphobic society. Um, and I have tremendous respect for our queer and trans elders who did so much to lay the groundwork for things to change and got us the, the rights that we do have today. You know, working with older adults um, has really been an honor because I've gotten to encounter so many LGBTQ plus rights pioneers. Um, and I think we all have to remember that this is, this is a constant struggle, just the way that it is um, to fight racism in this country, right? And to fight ableism in this country and to fight ageism. These are all, um, these are all linked. Okay. That's where I want to start with that, with that answer. Yeah. Now, given um, all the, the challenges that the community faces, people who identify as queer, LGBTQ, et cetera, um, what, what can be done in the mental health system to help them? And, and what challenges do they face mentally? Well, we know that um, minority stress, which is the concept um, that Dr. Alan Meyer uh, um, developed, right, a, a model that he developed to describe the stressors LGBTQ plus people experience due to their sexual orientations and gender identities in a homophobic and transphobic world, we know that minority stress has deleterious effects on our mental health, right? And we have to take that into consideration when we look at statistics, numbers, why people who are part of queer and trans communities tend to have more negative mental health and physical health outcomes than their cisgender and heterosexual counterparts. Um, I think that when we're looking at systems of mental health care, we need consumer voice taken into account all the time, right? There need to be community advisory boards that are taken seriously in every mental health care system, clinic, institution. Um, there needs to be ongoing training in queer and trans affirmative care. Um, and that we, 
really have to um, consider the ways in which minority stress and historical trauma impact LGBTQ people who are seeking services or reluctant to seek services because of the way they've been treated. So queer affirmative uh, therapy is um, a, th a form of therapy that's sensitive to the experience of being queer. Um, can you tell us more about it? Sure. So queer affirmative therapy really refers to an approach to working with queer um, folks and, and people who identify in ways other than queer part of the larger LGBTQ plus acronym that not only affirms, but celebrates our identities, normalizes them, embraces them, recognizes varying sexual orientations and gender identities as healthy parts of human identity. And I think that um, the problem with the idea of queer affirmative therapy in many settings is that people think that they can do like a one-off training and practice it, or perhaps because they are LGBTQ plus identified themselves, they automatically know how to do it. And that's just not really the case. It requires training. It requires ongoing support. It requires um, continuing education. And, and I don't just mean getting CE credits to keep up a certification. I mean, really um, any kind of, of education that uh, keeps us up to date with the, the latest trends and theories and helps us to get a better understanding of how to provide um, culturally affirmative care. What qualities should a queer affirmative therapist have just as a person who's going to perform some uh, therapy of this quality? And, uh, and, and, and on the other hand, what, what qualities can be trained uh, you know, so what are innate, what are trained, what, what should be innate, what should be trained? Yeah, I love, I love the way you framed this because I think the things that make someone a good queer affirmative therapist are the things that make someone a good therapist in general, right? Being open, non-judgmental, compassionate, warm, having unconditional, what we call unconditional positive regard for our clients. Um, and I don't think that those things can be taught. I think that they can be fostered um, with time that they can further develop, especially when we work on, say, burnout prevention with clinicians. Um, but the things that really need to be trained into someone aren't how to be compassionate. They're how to re use respectful terminology, how to better understand um, what it means to be non-binary, for instance, which I know is a term that is newer to some therapists who have not practiced extensively with LGBTQ folks, right? And um, the things that can be trained are um, what is appropriate to ask and explore in a therapy session with an LGBTQ client versus what is not. For instance, I think that there's still this notion in mainstream society that it's okay to ask trans people personal questions about their bodies, right? And that's just not something that we start a conversation with um, or necessarily get into the nitty gritty of if that's not what a client is there to talk about. Um, so all of that being said, I think most of it's pretty clear cut, what we can get from trainings versus the qualities we need to embody in order to be a culturally affirmative therapist. Here's an important question. Are people who are queer or on the spectrum of the LGBTQ spectrum um, cooler than the general public? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and and what, what qualities makes them cooler? What qualities well, and experiences makes them, you know, um, more interesting people? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely being tongue in cheek, but I will say, I will say, first of all, that I love being part of queer community. I do think for the most part, it's very cool, especially when we are not eating our own online in vicious fights. Um, but also that one of the things I love about being part of queer community and fostering queer community is that we are all survivors 
we're all survivors and we're, we're all fighters. And I think that that is very cool. And I think that that's the case really of any marginalized community that has made it in a uh, white dominant, white, suprem white supremacist, heterosexist and cissexist society. I think it's very cool to have survived. Yes, um, the queer community has its own uh, unique challenges, um, and but yet every everyone has their own unique challenges. But people who are members of the queer community have those challenges in addition to being uh, having the, the the challenges of being queer in the society. Right. Uh, Plato once said, "Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle." I and, love that. Yes. And what great battles have you fought if you'd like to discuss your personal issues? Sure, sure. So I have reckoned with um, what I would now call major depressive disorder since I was about 15 years old, so over 30 years. Um, and in, I, I write about this in, um, in the anthology I mentioned, Head Case. In 2010, I um, witnessed my partner's, my then partner's suicide. And those experiences of both um, surviving very scary depressive episodes, um, especially when I was younger and didn't really understand what was happening, along with the trauma of seeing my partner die that way at my home, um, I feel like surviving those experiences helped me to I don't want to get too, too sciencey here, but I, I'm just going to say, help me to develop neuroplasticity um, and learn to do things in different ways as I got older to build a life that was better than the one I had before, um, before the episodes, before the suicide, um, before the hospitalization I experienced. And, and with each challenge that I have survived, that felt insurmountable, right? Life continued to get better later. And that really feels like a gift. You know, I don't want to bright side things. I don't want to be a Pollyanna or make light of my struggles or anybody else's. Um, but I feel like I am such a kinder and more cheerful person having gotten through what I got through. And I'm very grateful to say that I, I really consider myself to be in remission from depression these days. Um, and while I can't guarantee myself that I won't experience another scary episode, you know, I cherish every day of my wellness. Today, what kind of things, what kind of emotional struggles do you still have? Um, you know, I think the pandemic has made things very complicated in terms of loneliness. Um, because of surviving COVID in 2020, I developed chronic illness um, that has really radically changed the, the texture of my life in some ways. I can't do a lot of the things I used to be able to do. And so it's very hard for me that I'm at home alone a lot, um, which I didn't used to have to be. So when restrictions, restrictions started being lifted and people were going back out into the world and starting to do things again, I found that I couldn't do a lot of those things. And I'm still experiencing a lot of social isolation. And that makes me sad, but it doesn't make me depressed. So that, that feels like an important distinction. Tell us more about this distinction between sadness and depression. Sure. For me, depression often entailed a sense of active distress as well as feeling down. Um, and it would often be hard to function in ways I considered normal for myself. Um, in my last major depressive episode, I was in such bad shape that I wasn't eating. I was finding it hard to um, leave my bedroom. I was becoming less and less verbal. And when I'm sad, none of those things happen. I just feel sadness 
And sometimes I will be a little more tearful than usual, but I'm still functioning and I still feel hope. Mm -hmm. What is there to feel hopeful about? You know, in spite of so many things going to hell in a handbasket right now, socially and politically, I would say that I am always inspired to feel hope by um, movement building efforts, the tirelessness of um, activism that I see all around me, the people who have been organizing for decades, continuing to um, spearhead important work to make change, uh, the ways in which I see people coming together. They've come together to promote mutual aid efforts throughout the pandemic. That makes me feel very hopeful that people really care about each other in my community and other communities, you know, in ways that I can see and ways that I don't see, but I know that they're out there. That gives me hope. Yeah. You mentioned mutual aid efforts. Um, I'm trying to organize a mutual, uh, an emotional support mutual aid effort. Maybe we can, if you have, I can bounce that off of you uh, off camera and we can talk about it. Sure. But, um, oh my God, it's, it's so early in the interview. And, and we've, we've already, we've already run out of topics. Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> Uh, well, my mind is fairly empty right now, but let's talk about transgender topics. Oh, okay. Um, let's talk about um, how difficult it is to be transgender in this society and and is it, is it just as difficult to be non-binary as it is to be transgender? I mean, I would have a very hard time saying that. As a cisgender person myself, I, I can't really speak for trans or non-binary people or people who identify as both of those things, right? I, I, I do think that um, when folks who identify as non-binary are not recognized as non-binary, and so they're misgendered, people use the wrong pronouns or names for them, that um, is incredibly harmful, right? And I think that sometimes for trans people who um, are established in their genders and their lived identities and people are using the right pronouns and the right names for them, that may be, that may make things a little bit simpler, um, but I, it, it's really hard to kind of speculate beyond that, and I, I certainly don't want to uh, disrespect anybody's lived experience that's not mine, you know? Yeah, um, in the uh, essay I read, um, There, there's a, spe a specific type of therapy for transgender folk um, that is sensitive. It, it goes, it's, it's a little deeper than simply, you know, queer affirmative um, because I believe of all the queer folk out there, people who, who are transgender are having the hardest time. I mean, especially transgender folk who are uh, BIPOC. Um, they're getting killed out there, literally getting killed. For real. And, and so um, how, how, how would you perform therapy in a way that helps a, a transgender person to um, feel safe? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think that, you know, one of the one of the sort of hallmarks of gender therapy is that it is affirming and creates a safe space for people to be their authentic selves. Right. And that um, a gender therapist can. I don't want to I don't want to get too jargony, but I'm thinking also that a, a good gender therapist can create the kind of holding environment 
for a person who is not being affirmed elsewhere in their lives or by say their biological family, especially younger people whose parents um, don't, don't approve or are outwardly, you know, transphobic. Um, I think that a, a good gender therapist can help to um, help a client to heal around that and to provide the sort of support and affirmation that's so very necessary. Um, I, I don't think that there is a specific mode of therapy used with either um, LGBTQ and or TGNB folks, right? When we say gender therapy or we say queer affirmative therapy, we're not talking about a specific type of treatment uh, like cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavior therapy, et cetera. Right. There hasn't been, um, while, while models are being developed, I don't think that there has been a specific type of therapy created for folks of varying sexual orientations and gender identities. And I'm really interested in learning more about that. Um, I'm, I'm on a medical leave right now, but I am enrolled in a doctoral program in social work where I'd like to explore this a little bit more along with um, the experiences of people who are, like me, part of the community, providers, and peers. Because we don't hear a lot of people talking about that, you know? And I think that there are so many interesting conversations that can be further opened up. In the essay that I read in the book, um, Headcase, um, mm -hmm. about queer affirmative therapy, there was a section that specifically dealt with transgender uh, clients and and the the issue was uh, how how quickly the, the the affirmative therapist approves the transition uh, and and you know you need a diagnosis for a transition right right there's this whole issue of gatekeeping where medical and mental health care professionals have to deem you um, ready right to proceed with hormone therapy, um, um, gender affirming surgeries, et cetera. And it's hugely problematic, hugely problematic. And, uh, you know, as we're all hearing in the news right now too, there are such horrible things happening um, in other states around the treatment of trans youth. I mean, it's just, it's appalling what these poor kids are being put through and what their parents are facing for uh, allowing them to affirm their genders. I'm sort of digressing, sorry. For allowing bad. them to affirm their genders and proceeding with the transition surgery? In, in proceeding with medical transition, um, parents in, I think it's Texas, can be... Uh, uh, convicted as child abusers. Oh, okay. I mean, it's so, it's so unreal. I, well, on, I think it's unreal, but it's very real and it's awful. On the other hand, the essayist who wrote about this topic also warned about uh, therapists who are too quick to uh, pass uh, to p give a pass to a, a transgender person who, who wants to move forward with the transition uh, because uh, you called it a, a gatekeeper. The, the mm -hmm. therapist is like a gatekeeper. Uh, they can either uh, help uh, someone move forward with transitioning or they could, they could make it more difficult. Um, but uh, th those who, who were too uh, quick to approve and to diagnose, we're also criticized in this essay, there has to be a balance, right? There, there should be some conversation. There should be some uh, probing maybe. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's a very controversial idea that, um, that therapists might be too quick to write, say, a surgery letter. Um, and I'm very happy to say that there is a list circulating online of therapists who will write letters on the first appointment because it's such life-saving care for so many people of trans experience. Um, I'm sure that there are more conversations about this happening uh, out, out 
on the internet and and in other circles. Um, but I think it's crucial for mental health care professionals to do everything that they can to affirm trans folks' identities and help them get whatever care it is that they feel they need and want. And as a cis person, I feel like I have no right to stand in the way of that. Right. Um, at the same time, um, I think that this issue often comes up with younger clients and I'm a geriatric social worker, so it's not something I interface with a whole lot in my own work. Okay, okay. All right, but you are going to uh, explore it in a dissertation, right? I'm hoping to explore in my capstone um, the experiences of queer and trans therapists who self-disclose about their own status as peers or having lived experience to communities of practice and what the benefits of that are. So in other words, I'm not talking about therapists talking to their clients mm -hmm. about living with a mental health condition. I'm talking about therapists talking to each other about mm -hmm. being in this field and having our own mental health conditions. Because I'll tell you what, every LGBTQ plus therapist I know has something going on emotionally that they're dealing with. And some of them talk about it. Most of them don't right? I've um, published a few things about having lived experience as a queer therapist, and it's been pretty scary every single time. But you know what? I still have my job. I'm still writing about this. I've come out over and over and over again. And I think that bringing that authenticity to the table is crucial. I think it benefits all of us, and it chips away at stigma whenever one of us speaks up. So I, I really want to continue that dialogue. So uh, has the dialogue uh, started? Uh, who's starting it and what does it look like? Is it in the form of Zoom, Zoom groups at the very least of uh, queer identified therapists? Um, I started a Facebook group. It's pretty small, but occasionally there's some dialogue on there. Um, and I'm hoping that the articles I've published online this year also get people thinking and talking. Um, last year, maybe it was the year before last, actually, it's that pandemic time blur, I started a Zoom-based peer support group for queer therapists. There were, I just, I handpicked a few friends, invited them, and we met maybe bi-weekly or monthly for several months. Um, and I think it was really helpful for all of us. I would love to sort of replicate that model on a grander scale at some point. What were some topics that were covered in that group? You know, we did a lot of talking about just really difficult situations at work and uh, counter-transference in our clinical work so that, you know, when a client would present with a difficult issue that resonated with us, our feelings about that. Um, I probably at some point talked also about um, how it feels to be a peer who is in a senior level position at an outpatient clinic, um, who is not a certified peer specialist, but talks openly about her mental health. Because this is what I keep coming up against, right? When you're a certified peer specialist, you're out by nature of your title, um, your credential. When you're an LCSW, you're not. The expectation is that you don't talk about your lived experience. When you're a certified uh, credentialed, um, alcohol and substance abuse counselor. I think that's what KSAC stands for, the credential. Um, when you're a KSAC, right, the, generally the idea is that your own recovery history brings you legitimacy and it helps your um, formation of alliances, therapeutic alliances with clients. In clinical social work, that's not the case. We don't do that. And I wanna know why it is um, that we're also quiet with each other, right? What's holding us back? What are the risks and what are the benefits? Is it considered a breach of uh, like uh, social worker ethics to uh, disclose uh, personal issues about your personal life to clients, uh, such as, you know, your, your mental health history or what have you, or right. experiences? I I don't think it's a breach of the code of ethics, but I think we're all very aware 
that disclosures need to be handled very carefully with a lot of intention behind um, the reason, right, the reason for the disclosure. Are we disclosing to make ourselves feel better or to benefit the clients? If it's to make ourselves feel better, we're not doing it. So I, I can't really think of uh, a time in a therapy session when it would be appropriate to get into details of your own mental health history. But at the same time, I do think that it can be okay to say to a client, you know, I've experienced some depression too. I wonder if X, Y, Z might be helpful to you. Okay, it, helps, right? it helps normalize the experience, destigmatize, maybe take away some of the shame. I found X, Y, Z really helpful. I wonder if this is something that might appeal to you too. And what if the client asks to explore your experience to see if it resonates with them? Um, that's when you refocus on the client and say, well, the session, you know, the session is really about what we can do um, working together on your situation and how you want to move forward, right? So, so taking the focus away from yourself as therapist and putting it back onto the client. All right. So it sounds to me that if uh, a therapist is going to disclose, it would just be grazing the surface just for a specific uh, purpose. I mean, I do, I do think that self-disclosure should be brief. Um, they should be focused and they shouldn't take up the the whole session. Yeah. So, so the idea of um, some personal disclosure, I think can be therapeutically helpful, but it has to be limited and it has to be very, uh, very well thought out. Well, have you done it? And what was the result? I talked a little bit about having chronic illness with a client who has chronic illness, also chronic pain. Um, and I was able to make some recommendations that the client found helpful because of that. And you know, what ended up happening was the client didn't want to hear my whole history of chronic illness. The client wanted to know how they could feel better. And so I was able to provide some, some thoughts about that, share some ideas. Uh, and when peer specialists are trained, they're trained to not call their peers clients, but, you know, uh, just, I guess, other peers. How do you feel about being a peer uh, social worker, however, um, and, and relating on the level of this is my client and I'm the social worker and having that, uh, it's, it's kind of a barrier, right? Uh, you know, I feel like, um, I didn't really know what the role, whether role confusion might come up for me around this um, when I went into clinical work. Um, I have not really felt like anything is at odds for me. And it occurs to me, you know, clients could Google me. They could see my whole history online and all of the tell-all articles I've written, right? And if they did that, that's their prerogative. It's also very, very different from me disclosing to them in a session. I'm not going to hide who I am, but I'm also not going to make myself the center of attention. Um, in terms of having clients versus working with other peers, you know, I feel like we have to be collaborative and we have to be authentic in the therapeutic relationship. That's so important. And I know some people don't like the, the term client. Um, and I've heard folks use um, other terms like, well, consumer comes up a bit, which I don't like at all. It just sounds so capitalist to me, right? <laughs> I, don't mind, I don't mind the term client when it's used for me or when I'm referring to someone else with whom I do therapy. That, that's just me. That's my own personal thing. I'm okay with it. All right. Okay. So I'm okay with using that word too, like throughout this conversation. So like, um, what, what can clients learn about you on the internets? About me personally? Yes. Uh, well, I've written a series of articles about my dual identities as provider and peer. Excuse me. I've also, um, I've written about um, my experience of surviving my partner's suicide. Um, I've done some interviews for magazines and radio shows and things in which I talk about my lived experience. Um, you know, so it, it's all out there. 
that, that kind of stuff is all out there. The depression, the, the partner, the hospitalization, the right. uh, surviving. Yeah. So don't you think if, um, if, it, if a client uh, reads and listens to some of these things about you, uh, that they would be very curious and want to explore that in a session? It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. And I'll tell you what else, Dan, here's the thing. Um, more and more, I'm doing program management as opposed to individual clinical services. So that's also a thing like I have no intention of going into private practice. I've just never been interested in it. If that was the case that I was in private practice, I think the dynamic might be very different and it might feel like a different risk level for me as well. But that's not where I'm at. I'm mostly these days. I'm mostly a program director um, and a trainer and, uh, you know, freelancing as a writer editor. I don't do that much direct service. So gotcha. there's, there's also that, you know, there's just the role. Well, that, that, that certainly makes it a lot easier if you're doing more administration than direct uh, therapy and service. Um, right, right. And, it, you know, it occurs to me, too, when people uh, don't talk about their lived experience as therapists, like a lot of them are in private practice, right? They have a, diff a very different dynamic than I do right. and a very different situation with a different, um, a different level of risk. And also, you know, I'm a, I'm a white cis woman. Um, and so I have a, a level of privilege to be able to talk about all of this, I feel, um, that, uh, of which I'm cognizant. There's a lot of privilege inherent in my ability to be out as a peer provider. Why is it more dangerous for a BIPOC woman to be out as a peer provider? I, I feel like because we still live in a very racist society, um, for people of color and trans and gender non-binary people to be out in their workplaces as queer and having lived experience, it is a bigger, they face bigger risks. I think that, um, you know, we're, we're not nearly where we need to be in terms of anti-racist work and the emphasis on DEI in so many organizations isn't going as far as it, it should or could. I think, uh, and you think that um, having groups and uh, meetings and organizing the uh, providers, the, uh, the, the queer uh, affirmative therapists um, could lead to some positive change. Yeah, I think that when we support each other, great things could happen. Right. It's building community for this special community of professionals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. Are you wondering if I love cats? Because the answer is yes, absolutely. Oh, is there a, is, what, <laughs> is, is that a cat pocketbook? No, it's a phone pocketbook that it's I a, see it's a hanging. Phone pocketbook, yes. <laughs> but what, <laughs> why did you mention cats? Is there something cat-like that I'm seeing here? Well, you paused. Um, so I just thought I would take that opportunity to mention my love of cats. Well, all right. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a cat lady. In, in How many cats? I mentioned. Oh, just nine. No, I'm kidding. I, I'm not serious. I only have two. <laughs> okay. Um, and what are their names? Their names are Enchi and Tiny. Why Enchi? Where did that come from? Uh, his shelter name was Enchilada. So it's uh, shortened from that. And he came with the name. So I, you know, wanted to keep it. Um, and uh, <laughs> do you have any pictures? Of these cats? Uh, I do, but not not immediately reachable. I All right. Send, I could send some to you later if you want to post them. <laughs> yes, that would that would be nice. I um, these I, are the things these are the things I tend to talk about incessantly: um, queer mental health, cats, and food. <laughs> oh, let me ask you: you're you're are you more of an administrator now, currently? Yes. Do you do any direct service at all? Yes, you I do still do. 
I still do a little bit of psychotherapy. Yeah, I would be very sad not to have that. But largely, I um, but largely I do program management for this for a geriatric program, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why have you chosen older adults to be your population? I've always loved being around older adults. Um, I think it was it really started with the the relatives. It, it, I just got along really well with my older relatives growing up, my grandparents, my great grandmother, I adored them. Um, and then in high school, I was a candy striper for a while. Um, and then when I went to social work school, I don't, I don't understand why I didn't um, focus my concentration on working with older adults. Like it took me a while to realize this is what I should be doing. But I finally got a door, a foot in the door it at Sage uh, about a decade ago, working with LGBT older adults, and I fell head over heels in love with it, just like I kind of knew I would. Um, so I, I I no longer work at Sage, but um, the agency where I work partners with Sage and provides mental health care services to their to their um, members, and I just I feel like it's absolutely the right place for me. Um, spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, are you an atheist or do you have a spiritual life? Can you tell us about that? Oh, I love that you asked this. Um, I would say I'm agnostic. Uh, despite my name, I'm actually Jewish by birth. And um, I was involved in a Quaker youth group when I was a high, when high school, which I feel like it saved my life, honestly. It was such a, a wonderful introduction to um, the peace building movement and a lot of the social justice activism that wasn't taking place in my high school itself. It was taking place with the, with the Quakers. Um, these days, I don't really practice anything, but I would say I embrace some spirituality. Um, you know, I've, I've studied Buddhism a little bit. I've studied yoga a little bit, yoga philosophy. Do you practice yoga or meditation? A little bit, yeah. I yes. was training to be um, I was training to be a yoga teacher some years ago, but I got in a bike accident and so that got thrown off course. I never finished. Is it possible to do like low uh, low exertion yoga? Yeah, you can do um, restorative yoga, gentle yoga, yoga nidra, which is um, a meditation that you do laying down, like a guided relaxation meditation. Have you experienced any um, spiritual breakthroughs? I don't know if I would say spiritual breakthroughs, but occasionally I have, um, I don't want to say premonitions either. That feels like a little too drastic. I feel like I have some insights into things that are rooted in being connected to the universe and paying attention to what's around me. I guess that's the best way I can put it. On very rare occasions, I will um, get a sense of something that has happened without anybody telling me that it's happened. Um, and I, I just tend to think that it's more like being tuned into, in, tuned into the universe than anything else. I don't really believe in being psychic per se. So you have a sense of something that happened. Can you give us an example? Sure. Um, last year, I was um, thinking randomly of an ex of mine from like over 20 years ago. And then I found out later that day that person had died. Oh. So things like that. Okay. Yeah. Or like recently I started having dreams about an old friend of mine I'd been out of touch with for several years. And um, I felt like the dreams were telling me I needed to make contact with this person and make sure they were all right. And so um, we ended up having a phone conversation for the first time in like, I don't know, six or seven years. And it turned out that, um, that they were in crisis. Yeah. So, so when... So when you were when you were thinking about the person in crisis, was there a sense of there was a sense of urgency? Exactly. Yeah. Do you consider yourself to be empathic? I think of myself as an empathetic person. I don't. Um, I don't really get the idea of being an empath. 
I'm, I'm many, many things, right? And they uh, all describe me, but I'm not any one thing. And I don't think that I'm, I don't know. I don't think I'm more special than other people. I just think I pay a lot of attention to feelings. Not that you're not more special or less special, but you might have possess certain gifts. I'll take that. That sounds good. What are your gifts? Uh, I, I would say that I am gifted in the kitchen and I will feed you a meal that will make you feel very happy. Um, wow. I would say I have a gift for, <laughs> this is so nerdy. I have a gift for proofreading. I've always been a good proofreader, even though I didn't receive training. Um, and I don't know if this is a gift, but animals tend to like me because I think they can feel how much I love them. And I'm really grateful for that. Do you love animals unconditionally? Yes, but I don't necessarily like them. <laughs> Do you love your cats? I love my cats, but that's the thing. Like I love Enchi so much and I really like him. And I love Tiny so much. And I don't really like her because she's not very nice to me. What? What? What's? What does she not? What does she do? She bites and hisses and gets pissy with me. Like when you want to show affection. Yeah, like sometimes I'll pet her and she'll just hiss. Oh well, will it start off really nice and then she'll change her mind? Sometimes, but sometimes right out of the gate, I'll just pet her and she'll look at me and go. <laughs> She, she was just diagnosed with end-stage breast cancer, which breaks oh, my heart. First of all, I didn't know cats could get breast cancer. Yeah. But secondly, I feel really bad for her. She's slowing down, and it's really hard to see. Oh. So I've, been, I've been trying to be, like, extra gentle and nurturing with her. She gets all the treats she wants. She can – I'll put a pile of pillows on the bed if she wants to lay on them. You yeah. Know, anything she wants. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Thank you. <sighs> See, it all comes back to cats. Have you ever had a near-death experience? Not that I know of. Um, do you know anyone who've had, who's had a near-death experience? I, I've known people who have gotten in pretty serious car accidents, but I don't, I don't know if they would be considered near-death experiences. You know, when someone dies and comes back. Yeah, I don't know that that happened to them. All right, let's talk about something else. Okay. Um, love. Love. I love love. What do you love about love? <laughs> um, I am, you know, even though I say I'm a cat lady, I would say also I'm very much a people person. Um, I value my relationship so much. And I think love is what makes life worth living. And I don't mean necessarily romantic love. I think friendship is the most important thing in the world. Do you believe friends can be family? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole concept of chosen family among LGBTQ plus communities, I mean, that's, that's all about the bonds we form as friends. When, especially when biological family rejects us. Exactly. Yep. We say that a lot in... Um, caregiving structures for LGBTQ older adults, right? If they didn't have kids um, or they might not have a partner or spouse who's caring for them as they age, it's often friends who have become family, sometimes, um, sometimes ex-partners um, too, with whom they've stayed very close. And this is kind of the future I see for myself, honestly. I mean, I'm not having kids. Uh, I don't have a partner or spouse. I think there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of caregiving among me and my other single friends as we age. Do you love yourself? I do. It took a long time to get here, but I do. And how do you show yourself love? I think... The first thing that come, the first things that come to mind about that are that I let myself rest when I need to rest, which is often, um, just because of health mishigas, and I set boundaries, um, which can be challenging because I'm a little bit of a people pleaser, 
And I'm always working on being less of a people pleaser and thinking about the difference between being kind and being nice. Something I've been reading about a little bit online as of late. What is the difference between being kind and being nice? I feel like being kind is doing right and compassionate things, whereas being nice is giving people what they want all the time. And those aren't the same. Mm -hmm. And I think especially for people who are socialized um, as female, you know, assigned female at birth and, and socialized as female, that we're um, frequently reminded to be nice. And the way that this can show up sometimes is like dudes harassing women on the street or on the subway and women not necessarily feeling comfortable telling them off or walking away. Now telling them off, I understand there can be some safety concerns, but walking away, I mean, I've, I've, I, I've done this before on the subway where I saw a man making a woman pretty clearly uncomfortable. And so I did the, the bystander thing, bystander intervention thing and said, oh, hey, did you want to come sit with me over there? Yeah. Because uh, for some reason we feel beholden to be nice right? and not to not offend. I find myself doing it sometimes too. Like when guys are kicking it to me on the street and I'm, and I'm sort of... I wouldn't say playing along, but I'm not just cutting it short and walking away because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. What? You yeah. Know? It's hard to unlearn. Um, Louis C.K., who's a controversial figure, <laughs> but he once said in his comedy that, and, and, and he, what we didn't realize at the time is that he was speaking for himself as well, he said that men are the worst thing that ever happened to women. I mean, he I'm said really that. I'm really disappointed in him. I loved, I loved his little role on Parks and Recreation. I'm so disappointed in him. And I think that, you know, we might, we might extrapolate from that that it's really patriarchy. The patriarchy is the worst thing that ever that's ever happened to men or women and to anybody who is non-binary or a gender or anything else, right? Yeah. Um, that it's it's living in a patriarchal capitalist society that's causing so much harm. And say what you want about Louis C.K. and all that behavior, but his his comedy uh, he did focus he 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 said in his comedy it's it's great to be white and male because of his, uh, he can go anywhere around the world and he, 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 he has more of a, uh, he can be, he can feel safe, he's privileged. He, 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 he expressed that in his comedy. He dealt with that issue of white privilege uh, as being white, white and privileged uh, before we were really talking about it a lot, you know. Um, so, he, so he acknowledged, he acknowledged it, yeah. privilege in his comedy, and he also exploited it. Yes, in his life. It's just, it's such a letdown. It's such a letdown. Yeah. Name five historical figures that you admire. Harriet Tubman. Eleanor Roosevelt. Leslie Feinberg. Bell Hooks. Who's a fifth? Billy Holiday. So these are all pioneering women. And uh, who's they a, are, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just riffing like off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Feynman, who's that? Oh, Leslie Feinberg wrote Stone Butch Blues. Um, okay. One of the, I think, the most important historical LGBTQ novels ever. Um, I'm not sure if Leslie used Ms. or Mix or Mr., um, but Stone Butch Blues is one of my all-time favorite books, and it was just such an important read to me when I was first coming out because it really taught me about butch femme history mm -hmm. and also made me feel like, oh my God, it's okay to be a femme. You know, these were very new concepts to me at the time. Is there any possibility of a relationship in your future? 
Um, I'm always building relationships. So I would say yes. An intimate partner. That would be nice, but I'm not sure if that's my path. Are you single and, and quite comfortable there? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, it gets a little bit lonely sometimes, but dating is like the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think like in a lot of ways, it's good to take a bit of time off. I had my last biggish breakup about two years ago. And I thought, you know, these things just keep not really going the way I would like. And maybe it's time to do a little, a little soul searching and pursue other, um, other interests and other goals. And that's how I ended up in a doctoral program you know, which um, studying lifelong learning feels so important to me. And so I try not to prioritize the idea of a romantic relationship over other meaningful experiences in my life. We have uh, three minutes. Please share, yeah. what, share whatever we haven't covered. Uh, make some points, anything you want. Okay, so all of that being said about a romantic relationship not being a, the biggest priority, if KD Lang comes and knocks on my door, I want to throw that entire statement right out the window. I've been waiting for her my entire adult life. Oh, I just, my God. Maybe if you're watching. Oh. You'll probably be watching. God's gift to women. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that voice and that face and the style. Just, oh, my God. Yeah. Woo. Well, all right. <laughs> I'm going to stop the video now. I think that's a good last word. <laughs>